two. The best voice that the ears of man can hear is to hear God say to you, well done. Matthew 25, from verse 14 to 23. Matthew 25, 14 to 23. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. I pray that on the last day, that's what you will hear. Now, I know Canada is cold. That doesn't mean your amen should be cold. And that doesn't mean your hallelujah should be cold either. (laughs) Now, I know I've been away for four years, but what has happened? Forgive me, I'm your dad. I'm also your coach. I'm 80 years old. Only God knows when next I'll be in Canada. So you better make the most of today. Okay? Uh huh. I told some of my children, I say, <laughs> some of you will miss me. When the time comes to go, at least we will say, it taught us. It told us some things. Maybe we, we didn't know. And we didn't pay attention. You better pay attention now. If a man dies at 80, you can't say he's an abiku. You can't say a witch killed him. No, no. <laughs> So listen carefully to every word now should be very important. That's why I say I will sit down to talk to you this morning. I'm not going to hurry. You have the whole day full, but this one is crucial. In the evening we'll be jumping and shouting. But this one I noticed when they said it is offering time. You were all quiet. Offering time should be a time when you should be shouting and jumping. Why? God says, I love a cheerful giver. You give him an offering grudgingly. Without excitement, you've wasted your money. Because if he doesn't receive the money, there will be no harvest. Do you understand what I'm saying? Next time you hear his offering time, even if you are the only one, shout and rejoice. Anyway, you live on credit here. So you can backtrack now and pay for that credit. Let me hear you shout hallelujah now. (laughs) So I pray that daddy will receive it. Uh, The best voice you can hear is for God to say to you, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what we're after. Our number one goal as a Christian is to make it to heaven. If we don't make it to heaven, who cares whether you are ordained or you are not ordained? So I'm praying for you one more time. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That is what you will hear on the last day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At least the amen this side now is, is a little higher. 
I think the people here, maybe because they've been singing, are a little tired. <laughs> and the best feeling anybody can ever have, particularly as you were about to leave this world, is the feeling that, ah, glory be to God, I have finished well. That's the best feeling you can ever have. Second Timothy chapter 4 from verse 6 to 8. Second Timothy 4, 6 to 8. Paul said, ah, I'm ready to go now. Ah, finished well. I'm going to my graduation. I'm going to be crowned very soon. You could feel the joy of a warrior who had finished very well. He would say, ah, now the battle is over. Now it is time for my decoration. The worst voice anyone could hear is to hear God look at you and say, ah, with all that I've entrusted into your care, with all I've done for you, with all I've poured into you, you still failed me. I pray that that will never be your portion. I warn you, if you will not say amen to my prayer, I will stop praying for you. I don't have time to waste. If you don't appreciate it, we won't worry about that. I say it one more time. That voice from the one who called you to say, in spite of everything, you still failed me, you will never hear that voice. Because that's what he said to Joshua. Joshua chapter 13. Verse 1. Joshua 13, verse 1. Joshua. You are old. And there's still a lot of land to be possessed. Joshua. You failed me. So terrible, terrible testimony. Because in Joshua chapter 1 from verse 1 to 8, Joshua 1 from verse 1 to 8, God told Joshua specifically, you are the one who will divide the land for my people. You will take over the land and divide it. Now Joshua, you are old. And there is see a lot of land to be possessed. Joshua, you are a failure. That's a terrible, terrible thing to hear. And the worst feeling anyone can ever have, the worst feeling, is for you yourself to feel, ah, I have failed someone who loved me. You know, in Matthew 26, verse 69 to 75, Matthew 26, 69 to 75, the Bible said, after Peter denied the Lord three times, and the Lord turned and looked at him, 
eyeball to eyeball. The Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly. Ah! I have failed the one who loved me. I pray for you from the bottom of my heart. You will never fail God. Some of you probably heard the story. When I was teaching years ago that your worst enemy might be yourself. And I gave the illustration of a man who had this violent temper. When he's angry, oh God. And he bought a new car. And the boy, his son, took a nail and scratched something on the new car. Father came out, saw the boy scratching on his new car. And he went into his rage. And the next thing he saw was a hammer. Before you knew what was happening, he had smashed the hand of the boy. It was the scream of the boy that finally got him out of anger. So those of you who say, my only fault is anger. You better cry to the almighty God that anything in your life that is contrary to the will of God will go today. And the boy screamed and his eyes opened he saw the fingers already mangled rushed the boy to the hospital and they had to amputate the fingers the following day he went to see the boy in the hospital and the boy said daddy when will my fingers grow again It was sad. He came home. And then he just felt, what was it the boy wrote on the car anyway? And he looked at it. And what the boy wrote is, Daddy, I love you. The man just went inside and killed himself. There is no feeling worse than the feeling that I have failed someone who loved me. You don't want to have that experience. But if you fail to do the work of fame that I sent you, <laughs> when the night comes, when you look back and you see that in spite of the love that God had for me, The work he gave me to do, I failed to do it. It's not going to be a pleasant feeling at all. It's not a question now of, I'm winning souls, I'm planting churches because I want to satisfy the general overseer. No, who is the general overseer? It's not the general overseer who saved your soul. Mm, You could get born again at one of the meetings where he preached. 
But he's not the Savior. It could be use of God to ordain you. It could be use of God to establish the school of disciples and the Bible college. It could be the vessel that God used to compose the uh, school anthem, college anthem, etc., etc. It could be used to pour the oil on your head, etc., etc. But it's not God. And when it is time to give an account, it's not going to be to man. It's going to be to God. That's why people like me walk tirelessly. Not to please any man. That's why when nobody is looking, when nobody's around, I keep myself holy. Because I don't want to fail someone that I know loved me more than anyone else. And he loves you. And excuses don't work with him. We've been given excuses since day number one. Adam, where are you? Um, I heard your voice. I'm in hiding. Why? Eh, I am naked. Ah, how come? Oh, the woman you gave me. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9 to 12. Genesis 3, 9 to 12. God is not going to take any excuse about Oh, it's my wife, it's my husband, it's uh, my family problem. That's why I could not do what you asked me to do. It's not going to work. First Samuel chapter 15, read the whole chapter. First Samuel 15, God said to King Saul, go and do a job for me. He did it halfway and stopped. And God said, what have you done? You know why nobody, when I picked you up and made you king, how come you didn't finish the work I gave to you, all the people? Because of the people. <laughs> why is the church not growing? In Canada, at the rate at which it should grow. <coughs> oh, the people. Uh, situations are different. Oh, this is not Africa. Here's that so. Every human being on the face of the earth goes to the toilet. Is that correct? Any human being, white, black, yellow, green, if they touch fire, it will burn them. Is that true? <coughs> so who told you that your neighbor would love to go to hell? That the reason you've not witnessed to that person is because, you know, he's high up there. Let me tell you the truth. You can be the number one man in the whole world. Put your hand in fire. You feel the same pain that your messenger who feel you have no excuse no excuse you have the name of Jesus you have the blood of Jesus you have the word of God 
You can pray the answers prayers. My beloved children, the big issue in your life, as in my life, is not that of death. We all know Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews 9, 27. We all know it is appointed unto man wants to die. We all know we are going to die. The big issue is after that comes judgment. The judgment, that's the issue. That's the issue. We know we are going to die. We know judgment is coming. Then follows another big issue. Even bigger than that of the judgment that will follow death. And that is, we don't know when. We don't know when. We don't know how much time we have left. (laughs) I was talking to my children somewhere else. And I said, my days are numbered. Oh, daddy, stop saying that. I said, it's not only my days that are numbered. Yours are number two. <laughs> I was 79 last year. I'm 80 now. You were 29 last year. You are 30 now. All of us, our days are numbered. Unfortunately, we don't know how many more days we have left. Night is coming. We don't know how soon it's going to arrive. Only God knows. In Luke chapter 13, from verse 31 to 33, Luke 13, 31 to 33, Jesus Christ said, I have three days left. So go and tell that fox, I'm going to preach today. I'm going to preach tomorrow. I have another three days. And then I go. Someone said, how come God doesn't just tell us how many days we have left? (laughs) Then you'll be on the same level as somebody who has been sentenced to death. He hides it from us. So we can keep on pretending the days are still many. But those of us who are wise, <laughs> I've seen some very elderly people dying their hair. Keep on dying, brother. <laughs> or oh, sister. <laughs> Stephen. In Acts chapter 6 from verse 1 to 8, Acts 6 from verse 1 to 8, the Bible told us this young man was one of the deacons chosen initially and he performed miracles, signs and wonders among the people. He was just a deacon. Everyone was saying this deacon is different. Signs, wonders happening through him. But he didn't know that he had only one more sermon to preach. Because by the time we get to Acts of the Apostles chapter 7 from verse 1 to the end, Acts 7 from verse 1 to the end, he preached one powerful sermon. At the end of the powerful sermon, he went to be with the Lord. But you can see the Lord standing to receive him. Well done, boy. 
I stand to salute your homecoming. Nobody knows which salmon is going to be the last one. You don't know. We had a Holy Ghost service in Nigeria. After this powerful service, after the service, one of my very, very good pastors entered into his car with his wife, and the driver drove to their house. They, 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 they have a house at the camp. They got home. The wife thought the husband fell asleep in the little journey home. When I say little journey, little by distance, not little by time because of the crowd. So the wife thought the husband fell asleep. Darlene, we are free so more. Wake up, let's, let's. Darlene was gone. You don't know the last sermon you will hear. My prayer is that you will all live long. That none of you will die before your time. The night is coming. We don't know how many days more that we have left. We don't know. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 from verse 1 to 18. Acts 11 from verse 1 to 18. James was at the meeting when they were discussing uh, doctrines. Should we go and preach to uh, Gentiles? Should Peter go to the house of Paulinius? He was there. He didn't know that the next thing we we'll hear about him is that the uh, king has cut off his head. Night may come by death or it may come by rapture. And I'm sure you know, no matter how young you are, you must have discovered by now death is not a function of age. Death can leave the father and take away the son. He's not interested in how old you are. When the appointed time comes, he, you go. Night can come by death. Oh, it can come by the rapture. Many of us don't even want to hear the word rapture anymore. Many of us are forgotten. Huh. Uh, the Bible made it clear in 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 51 to 54. 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 51 to 54. He said, in the true clean of an eye. Many seconds. The trumpets are sound. And those who are ready will go. Like somebody said, churches will see be full on the Sunday after the rapture. Those who are not ready will be around. Listening to CNN and Fox News and whatever other news telling you about what happened that nobody can yet explain overnight. For those who are left behind, that will be night time, first class. Because the Bible says, after the rapture, those who are left behind will be begging for death. And death will be far away from them. Why must you wake up now that you at least 
you still have today. Why must you today, as you leave this service, begin to invite those of your friends that you have uh, forgotten to come to the evening service just in case one or two of them might be born again? It's because many of nobody here, nobody here can say I will still be alive by tomorrow morning. Nobody can say that. I'm telling you, absolutely nobody. <laughs> we need to hurry up. In the work of evangelism, why? Doors are closing. Doors that used to be open, they are closing. And they can close very fast. They can close very fast. I remember years ago when we, we took the gospel to Zambia. I was visiting Zambia every three, three months. There was no need, no problem. You're coming from Nigeria, you are welcome, sir. Uh, how long do you want to say? Uh, just two weeks. Uh, they stamp your passport, six months. At the entry, entrance. You are welcome, sir. And then I suddenly, I, I was getting ready to go to Zambia. And I got a phone call from my people in Zambia. Sir, you must get a visa now. Uh, from home and there must be a letter written by the ambassador himself in Nigeria to say yes we know this man he can be allowed to come in what happened less than three months eh, well some people went they just, because in those days if you are a Zambian and you go to America you want a uh, visa they give you a visa in 15 minutes. Because Zambia declared itself to be a Christian country, so every Christian nation fell in love with them. And so some of my people from my own side, they discovered that. And uh, <laughs> they made the arrangement and they stole Zambia passports. And they traced the stealing to my people. And they said, from now, anybody from my people coming to Zambia. Those are closing fast. That's one. Two, who told you, for example, in 2018, that it will be four years before you saw me again? What caused the delay? Coronavirus. And for your information, coronavirus is a baby. The big ones are yet to come. All those who died during that, what do they call it? Pandemic? Nobody, none of them, none of them was thinking of death. We've lost them now. We can't reach those who are dead. We need to hurry up. We need to stop playing church. Oh, it's good to come to church, sing, shout. Uh, they're here. A 15 minute sermon. Everything now is instant. Instant coffee, instant whatever, instant salmon. Pastor is taking too long. What's wrong with him? Doesn't he know that uh, church's chicken is uh, getting cold? We need to be serious. 
Oh yes, we see what's going on in other denomination. You are not any other denomination. You are the redeemed Christian Church of God. You are a covenant church. In 2018, you know in Nigeria we have what we call go a fishing. In 2018, I was going a fishing as I used to do from one city to another city to another city to another city. By the time it was, I think, second day or third day of the going and fishing, I broke down completely. And I mean completely. So I had to spend, for the first time in my life, I had to spend Christmas Day in bed. That's how bad it was. And my when, of course, I recovered, you know, exhaustion, to rest, you get okay. And my people say, sir, you've done your bit. Relax. We will be doing the rest. I said, thank you. No more go out fishing for you. I said, thank you. You want me to be at home, Christmas period, sleeping. So that when I wake up in the evening, like David, I will see somebody who is bathing. <laughs> we are supposed to be on the road. If we die on the way, that's fine. We'll go straight to heaven. All I want to hear is well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. What do you want to hear? You want him to tell you you have failed me? No. Beginning from now, every time you wake up in the morning, you thank him for giving you another day. that day to redeem time because the Bible says you must redeem time because the days are evil we are living at the very end of the very end of time the reason I'm slow is because my uh, uh, national pastor uh, he, he didn't like me. Uh, uh, I've not been given the position I, re- I thought I should be given. Uh, oh yeah. Tell that to God. And he will tell you when you were born, you were born alone. Even twins came one at a time. When I saved your soul, I wasn't considering who's going to be your pastor. When I kept you alive while others were dying, we were not discussing who is helping, who is not helping, who is smiling at you, who is frowning at you. What is your excuse for failing me? Tell you one more story. And uh, we will pray. I was born again <laughs> way back in 73. And uh, God moved me very fast. Because he knew where I would be going. Within two years, I was ordained a pastor. Two years. They don't do that in the redeemed. The man who was ordained before me, as we knelt down to receive the oil, is the father of the uh, young man who <laughs> who was uh, presenting people for graduation in Bible college. 
his father, who had been in the church for 15 years before he came, obeyed the Sunday school superintendent for years, was ordained just before the, the poor dear on him before me. 15 years, me two years. That's a most absent signal to the devil. And so, because I was ordained, I was able to attend the minister's meeting. You know, when the pastors will come in once a year, we'll have a meeting with the general overseer or general superintendent, as we call him. And in one of the meetings, one of the pastors accused me wrongly. He said, I said what I didn't say. And was quite an influential pastor. And uh, my father in the Lord was there. I had, I said, sir, it's not true. I, uh, let, he said, shut up. I mean, and when Papa asks you to shut up, it's like Elijah talking to you. You better shut up. This is not true. I, I never do that. I shut up. So I shut up. When I left the meeting and I was on my way to the University of Lagos where I was a lecturer there, I was troubled. I was so troubled that I said, wait a minute, if this is what the gospel is, maybe I better go back to where I was coming from. And then God spoke. And I believe God is speaking to someone already. Yeah. My son, yes, Lord. Why are you thinking the way you are thinking? Oh, God, you know all things. You know what has just happened. Look at the way these people treated me. God spoke. I said, son, these people have disappointed you. Have I ever disappointed you? I said, no, Lord. made up my mind that day I'm going to serve God regardless of who is my pastor, who is my coordinator who is my this, who is my dad me and my God I'm going to give you five minutes to pray talk to God Daddy, I'm making a new resolution today. I will serve you to the very best of my ability. Thank you for giving me time to make amends. Thank you for the little time I may have left before night falls. But Daddy, as for me, I'm not talking about anybody. Me, it's me and you now all the way. And I will serve you to the best of my ability. I'm just asking, forgive my carelessness of the past and please render me for the future. Talk to the Lord and he will grant your request.
Jesus mighty name we have prayed may the almighty God hear your cry and I pray that on the last day what you will hear is well done That's only for those who said amen. I pray that when you are leaving this world, you will have the satisfaction of saying, I finished well. You will not fail God. If only because of all you've had these past two days, one way or the other, you will not fail God. We want to go on now to the Holy Communion service. Uh, please be seated. You will probably be wondering... How can we have a Holy Communion service after listening to that kind of lecture? I mentioned some things in the lecture we just had, and I want to just go over quickly a few points. And then you understand why we must have this particular Holy Communion service. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Ephesians 1, verse 18. It's a prayer of Paul for the Ephesians which is a prayer for you and for me, that the eyes, shall I say, of our understanding being enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Eyes of understanding. I tell you, you have more than the two physical eyes that you have. You have what is called mental eyes. Eyes of understanding. That is why when you understand something for the first time, you say, I see. May God open your eyes today. When we were in Canada, a young man of over 30 years of age came forward after he gave an altar call. I was shocked because I thought he had been born again for at least for at least 15 years. That's what I thought. But I gave the altar call after that summer and he came forward to give his life to Jesus. It means after all these years he just understood what we've been talking about. I pray if you like, say amen. If you like, don't. I pray that tonight God will open your eyes of understanding. My small role, some of you might know him, preached a very powerful sermon that had tremendous impact over many people. He talked about five 
most important questions in the life of a man. And he said the questions are, who am I? And he calls that the question of identity. Where am I from? He said that is a question of your source, your origin. He said the third question is, where to? Where am I headed? And he calls that the question of uh, destination, or what some people call destiny. He said the next question is, why am I here? And he calls that the question of purpose. And then finally he said the fifth question is, what can I do? What can I become? And he said that's the question of potential. I listened to that sermon, and uh, probably because I happen to be a student of mathematics, something struck me straight away. There are more than five questions. I know where I'm coming from. I know where I'm going. Question number six is, where am I right now in the journey from my beginning to my ending? Because from the day you are born, you begin the journey. That's why they don't say, how young is your son? They say, how old? Even if it's only a few days old, you're already on your way back. Where am I on the journey? That's question number six. But there's question number seven, which is the most crucial of all the questions. Because I have no control over the, over uh, my origin, no control over um, the purpose of why God sent me to the world, potential, etc., etc. But there is this crucial question, how much time have I left? How much time have I left? And I've prayed over that question for years before God himself finally gave me an answer. How come I don't know where I'm going to live? How come I, if I know when I'm going to depart, maybe, maybe I'd be a bit more serious. And you know what he told me? When, because he knew I was a teacher, and so he said, when do you tell the student the exam is about to be over? Usually few minutes before time is up. I've been a teacher all my life before I became a pastor. You set exam for three hours, the student began to write furiously. You don't want to disturb them. Let them keep on walking. When there are five minutes to go, suddenly you hear the examiner say, five minutes. When is God going to tell you you are about to finish? when the time is almost up. You know, the Bible spoke about certain people in First Chronicles, Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12 verse 32. First Chronicles 12 verse 32. He spoke about the 
children of Issachar. I know in America you call it Issachar, but in Israel they are called Issachar. What is so special about them? He said they had understanding of the times. As a result of it, they know what Israel must do. If only God would let you have an understanding of the times we are in. Nobody will need to preach to you again about going all out for Jesus Christ. When we were dedicating our headquarters in London, and all the big, big guns came, big guns from Anglican, from Methodist, from other Pentecostal churches, and I have to make a small speech. And I told them, when we were young, in the secondary school days, in the 1950s, we were taught that light travels in straight lines. I'm sure you probably had that one too. But years later, it was discovered, no, light does not travel in straight lines, it travels as a wave. You know what a wave is like? Up, down, up, down, up, down. That's how light travels. So I told them, the sign that revival is near is when things get terribly bad. The re last revival is around the corner because things had gone terribly bad. A week before that day, one of my pastors was arrested. What was his offense? He was asked to make a speech. And his offense was that he said, Ladies and gentlemen, how can that be an offense? There were people present who said they were neither male nor female. They said he left them out. So when you get arrested <laughs> for saying, ladies and gentlemen, you know we are at the bottom of a valley. The last revival is about to start. Will you be part of it? Whether you believe it or not, night is coming. Whether you believe it or not, the trumpet can sound any moment. You might have forgotten that Jesus is coming back, but he is coming. <laughs> he will be here soon. Many people thought that the, the last thing, the last sign that we are waiting for is that the gospel must be preached to all nations. I submit to you, the gospel is already being preached to all nations. Our pastor in Iran, and you, you don't know we have a church in Iran, told me, and it's an Iranian, Daddy, when we are talking, don't 
say in the name of Jesus, just say in his name. That both of us understand what we are talking about. And miracles are happening. As long as you cannot ban the internet, as long as you cannot ban the smartphone, I can reach anybody. The end is nearer than you think. I want to pray that the Almighty God will open your eyes of understanding. If you like, say amen. If you like, don't. No, it's one thing to say amen when I'm around and then forget before you get to That's it's up to you. But the Bible tells us a story in Luke chapter 24 from verse 13 to 31. Luke 24 from verse 13 to 31. It talked about two people after the Lord rose from the dead who were on their way to Amos. And then the Lord joined them and began to discuss with them. But the Bible said their eyes were withheld so that they won't recognize him. Even he came. They persuaded the Lord to wait with them to eat. And at the breaking of the bread, their eyes were opened. Tonight, as we break bread together, I pray in the name that's above every other name, your eyes of understanding will be opened. That's why we want to have Holy Communion immediately after that sermon. Because it doesn't matter how hard the pastor may preach. It doesn't matter how hard the general overseer may try to explain. It doesn't matter how passionate he may be about some of these things that he has been saying for the past two days. Unless the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, you might not understand. But he will do so tonight. You're going to bow your head for another two or three minutes and cry to God and say, let me be the one whose eyes of understanding will be opened tonight. Let me be that one. So that I can understand this thing for myself. I won't need anybody to force it down my throat. I will understand it myself. That I must walk the walks of him that sent me while it is day. Because the night is coming when no man can walk. As I partake of the Holy Communion tonight, Father, Please, open the eyes of my understanding. Let me see the truth for myself. Please do so, my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. So, my Father, my God, once again, I come to you on behalf of this, your children, and on my own behalf, too. As we partake of the Holy Communion tonight, 
do something special in our lives. Open our eyes of understanding. Let us know what the Holy Spirit is urgently saying to us before it is too late in Jesus' name. Thank you, my Father, my God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, please, the senior pastors. The senior pastors will please come. Uh, go to the table there. The elements have been blessed. And you serve the people.
have not been served, if you haven't got the element, uh, maybe you should shout hallelujah. If you haven't been served, shout hallelujah. Uh, you see, you can't even shout at a time like this. Wave your hand if you haven't been served and shout Hallelujah. What's going on? Do we have do we have more? Is anybody with more elements in the crowd there? Those of you who have not been served, come and join me here. If you have not been served, the elements, come and join me here. And when I say come and join me here, I mean you move. You come to the altar, come and join me here at the altar. Not down there, here, here. Don't you? I thought, I thought English is the official language here. Here means here. Let them come. Don't block their way. Let them come here to me, here. Usher, oh, protocol officer, don't stop them. I say, come here. If you have not been served, come and join me here. Do we have any element left? There's somebody has... Okay. As soon as you pick one, then you go back. Only those who have not been served should stay here. Okay. Oh, praise God. <laughs> we are going to we were planning to do taking Holy Communion by proxy and but now we can do it directly open to the bread section we've, we've, all, we've all been served thank you sir thank you sir When I give the signal and you eat the bread, you're going to cry to the Almighty God and ask Him to please open your eyes of understanding. Remember what we said at the beginning. This program is an individual thing. 
You're going to pray for yourself. And if you like, pray it sincerely. And it will surprise you. The Lord Jesus, the very night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead, eat, and pray. God will open your eyes of understanding. Thank you, Jesus. And then you open to the wine. And you're going to pray a prayer when you drink. That the Almighty God will give you the power to redeem time. So that you will see finish well and finish strong. After the same manner also he took the cup when he has supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as soft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. In the name of the Father. And of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And drink it and pray out loud. Pray out loud. Empower me afresh, O Lord. Give me the power, Lord, to redeem time. That I may see finish well and finish very strong. Finish very well. And finish very strong. Even before the night comes. Ramushi kinda rima karundre moko shunta. Rindre monko koto rinda makashi kinda monko shande. Randra makako romo ko shinde kere monko tunde kere moko shante. Rende kere moko sheke rende makakoto ndere makashante re moko tunda. Thank you, Lord. Re moko sheke rende karamo koto ndere moko ronde re makashanta. Thank you, Savior. Oh, thank you, Father. Blessed be your holy name. 
In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Oh, Lord, thank you. The Almighty God will grant your request. He will open your eyes of understanding. He will empower you to redeem time. He will give you the power to do his works. To preach. To heal. To raise the dead. To cast out demons. To take nations for him. That will begin right now. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Be seated for just a moment. I see one or two people going out. If you are, you are their friends, tell them to come back straight away. We want to say thank you to the Almighty God. That's our custom. Only a few people are shouting. And the Lord asked me to do something. And I believe he's asking me to do it because of one person. Years ago, the Lord asked me to wear seven agbadas. Many of you have had the testimony. I don't like wearing a bad I wear it once when I want to sing and praise God. The reason is whoever invented a bad invented something that has a mind of its own. Tell those children, don't go. Let nobody come out of here now. It's for your own good. I wore the seven brothers. When I finished, he asked me to lay them on the altar and to tell the people if you have any problem whatsoever, come and touch one. Touch, not hold. That's what he said. I did what he said. And all manners of miracles began to happen. And then there was a man who felt that his problems were many. And so he said, if a touch is going to solve a problem, a hold will be what he needed. In those days, the Holy Ghost night lasted all night long. So I got to my room around 8 a.m. At 5 p.m., he came to call me. That a man took hold of one of the Agbadas, and the power of God began to shake him as a dog would shake a rat. The shaking was so violent that he was about to die. So I had to come to beg God for him before the power of God released him. I beg you in the name that's above every other name, don't joke with what God is about to do now. Quiet. Thank you very much. You go downstairs too. 
everybody on the altar go down oh thank you lord the lord explained to me that there was a moment in the life of moses when his hand became no longer ordinary hands. When his hand became hands that could determine the course of war. When his hand became a hand that can be lifted across the Red Sea and there was a way where there was no way before, etc., etc. The Lord told me this moment was when he threw down the rod and he became a serpent and was asked to pick up the rod and as he bent to pick up the rod that has become a serpent to pick up the serpent his hand touched the ground his hand touched The holy ground. And from that moment onward, his hands were no longer ordinary hands. Please don't do what I'm going to ask you to do if you don't believe that the one talking to you is sent by God. But as we were praying, asking God to give us power to redeem time, I heard my daddy say, you're going to lie on this altar. That's me. For a few seconds. I don't know how many seconds he would tell me when to get up. After that, those who will come and touch any part of this altar, their hands will be coming in contact with holy ground. And they will be able to trace the time their ministry changed to this moment in history. You might be praising God in your heart in advance. But whatever we are going to do will be done decently. Those in the front row will come, you touch, not wait, just touch, go back to your seat and continue to praise God so that others may come. In the meantime, you might want to put your thanksgiving offering in your, in your envelope. If you need an envelope, you wave your hand, they give you one. You want to write? You may better write now because I don't know the amount of power that is going to surge through you. It might be a bit difficult to hold a pen for some minutes. I don't know. So if you need an envelope, maybe you better wave your hand so they give you one. You want to prepare your Thanksgiving offering. Prepare it now.